Fashionistas here. Welcome to the Wellness Lounge and Talk Series, New York Fashion Week Edition, the Psychology of Beauty. Give it up, everybody. Yes. So listen, our goal with today's discussion is to empower you to how to live a life that you love through health and wellness. So we have experts and panelists up here that will talk about beauty, body, everything all in between, and you guys will have a chance to converse with this panelist as well, okay? All right, so please say hello to my first guest. Her name is Dr. Michelle Henry. She is the clinical instructor of dermatology at the Will, Will Cornell Medical College here in New York City. Second up here on the panel is creator of Chemo Bentley of Beauty. Her name is Chemo Bentley. And last but not least is Mr. Fresh himself, a good friend of mine, Mr. Randy Reed. He is a male groom expert and facialist, and he also did my facials as well. And he used to style me too. He's all that and then some. Give it up for Mr. Randy Reed. So let's get right into it, because time's a ticket. Right? So, Dr. Henry, are women and men making their skin pay the price for the sake of achieving a level of beauty? I think so. I think absolutely. Especially in this social media age where everyone is trying everything. It's kind of the DIY age where everyone's making their own little concoctions at home. And um, we were just talking about it earlier that they're latching on to trends that may or may not be safe. And everyone's looking for that Photoshop filtered look that. Um, that Instagram provides, and so people are making dangerous choices. There was just an article in the New York Times that talked about people coming in and asking for their doctors to make them look like this particular filter, which is scary. Um, it's scary from a psychological standpoint and the fact that we think that this is a, a, a reasonable standard, that it's something that we can actually achieve, so that's scary. Um, and it's scary because the lengths that people will do to get there. Patients are doing everything. I have patients coming in and making masks of Clorox to, to help fight their acne. You have patients using undiluted apple cider vinegar because apple cider vinegar is natural, but not all natural things are safe. So I always tell my patients that, you know, snake venom is natural. So just because it's natural doesn't mean that you're protected. You still have to use natural things in a safe way. And you have to think about the dose, the concentration, all these things that can burn and damage your skin. I have patients coming in using, still using toothpaste. We know that's an old school one, but people are still and doing aspirin. it. Uh, aspirin, exactly. Yeah. So aspirin is basically salicylic acid, um, but when used in its pure form, can burn the skin. And especially a, a large number of my patients are patients of color, and so we know that we're all prone to hyperpigmentation. So if you blow on my skin, I feel like I'll get hyperpigmentation. So these patients are coming in with dark spots, they're coming in with burns, mm -hmm. they're coming in with worse hypopigmentation, so white spots that we can't treat well. We really don't have a lot of devices to treat that um, in a form that is usually acceptable to most. So a lot of people are trying things without guidance and it's really scary. I had a patient recently in the emergency department. So last week a young guy came in, he, uh, we diagnosed him with chicken pox mm -hmm. and he's 30 years old. Never had chicken pox before in his life until recently. I mean, it spread all over his body and face. He put apple, uh, the vinegar? Yeah, the apple cider vinegar. Yeah, and burned his skin. He has holes in his skin. I was so upset. I'm like, what? What do you do? He said, yeah, but it's natural. I'm like, what happened to the oatmeal bath? Didn't your grandmother teach you that? What happened to the calamine motion? Remember the, 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 the pink, pink bottle? bottle? That's what we use. Yeah. And, that, and he was like, no, I just went and they got the vinegar because this is all natural. But I said, baby, but you have holes in your skin now. And he did. It, the blisters ruptured, the vesicles ruptured, mm -hmm. and now he has permanent scars. And I had to sit there and talk to him about it, and that's when he realized that reality hit. And I said the same thing to him. Just because something is natural doesn't mean it's meant for you in the first place. Everything has a side effect to it. Just because it worked for one individual doesn't mean it works for you. You know, right. Every skin type is different. Every skin need is different. You know, My skin is not your skin is not your skin. And so really you need something that is prescribed for you. So right. you need to see a skincare expert, whether it's your dermatologist, your esthetician, whomever, someone who knows and understands skin to really give you something that's individualized and specific for your skin needs right. or else you're really taking a big risk. Right. Randy, do you find it more of a difficult task to get men to focus on adopting a grooming routine and skincare regimen? I think in the, in the men's grooming industry, kind of what's been missing in the past, uh, kind of to go off what uh, Dr. Michelle Henry said is, for a long time there was not really a standard for men's grooming. So let's just say depending on your background, if you're 
black versus if you're white, if you're Hispanic, there are different concerns and different needs, essentially. I think what's really important for men is trust. That's what it comes down to. Whoever they're watching or as, as far as, you know, whatever their skin questions may be, they want to feel like it's somebody they can trust and is relatable. And they also feel like they have the same questions and needs that they have. So I think now with social media, I think a lot, a lot of men, especially younger guys, are just a bit more concerned about their appearance because they're sending out you know, they're doing selfies and Snapchats and all these other things. It's important to be interested in, in, and be aware of what you look like, but also be aware of what's going inside of your body as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of times that, you know, a lot of people, you know, they think of skin as something totally different, but it's an organ. And I can actually, you know, with certain people can tell that there's something internally that's going on with you and you need to get your liver checked out or you need to get your, your, your heart checked out. You need to see your cardiologist or your primary care physician because your skin, the color of your skin can tell me if there's a, a, a disease that is brewing in, inside of you. And so it is important to be aware of what you look like and take care of your outside, but also remember to take care of your inside as well. Um, so Kima, do you work with a lot of men as well or is just more so you focus on um, skin care for women? No, I actually work with a lot of men and they are coming in the office for aesthetics, they are getting educated may it be good or bad on social media when it comes to what to do as a man for their skin. It's uh, no longer the standard Dove soap. They're asking about the charcoal cleansers. They're asking, is it good to use toners, moisturizers? And I enjoy seeing that. Um, I try my best to give them realistic expectations when it comes to skincare. It's not a, a quick fix. This is a microwave society, so what tends to happen is they come in for one treatment and they think, okay, flawless skin, I never have to come back, or I'll see you in a year, Miss Bentley. I try to, to educate them and tell them the right way to come in, the, the good products for them, especially if they're battling uh, pseudofolliculitis barbae, or if they are dealing with discoloration or sun damage. It's just the education has to be by credentialed professionals. You know, I'm a really strong advocate for that. And, you know, having people see that there are experts out there that can help you once again, having trust. And why do you advocate for natural products? Advocating for natural products is important to me. Um, I initially went to the doctor for my daughter who had eczema as a baby, and she was my, my newborn first baby. I was hurried out of the office with a prescription where I was not comfortable with that. And I went home and I started doing research on the oatmeal. Mm -hmm. I'm old school, so. Mm -hmm. You know, this is where my, my research came about, and I cleared her skin. She's now 15. She's eczema-free. She hasn't had another reoccurrence, and I am a true believer in natural products because of that. What do you think about that, Dr. Henry, especially you being a well-known dermatologist here in New York City yeah. and throughout the nation about I, natural products? I, I'm not opposed to natural products. Right. I think that there's a time and a place for them. I think, of course, we always want to do the minimal amount of harm. So if we have a condition that we can treat mm -hmm. um, with something that's natural, that's potentially less aggressive, because it's not always less aggressive, um, that might have a more favorable um, side effect profile, that's what we want to do. Um, what I'm not a fan of is allowing conditions to progress because we're not using something that is appropriate for it. So um, I recommend a lot of natural treatments for my patients. And again, if it's something that can be effective, and it's gonna be low risk, it's always going to be my go-to. Um, but patients often come in with things that require medication, that require kind of a higher level of, or a, a more aggressive treatment plan to get them to a place where they can then maintain at home with natural treatments. So I think they're complementary. Um, I'm definitely not opposed to it, and I'm not always 100% for using a prescription medication. Um, it's all about assessing the patient, again, looking at their individual needs and finding out what will treat them best with the lowest risk in an appropriate time period. I know we've talked about reality television and social media, and I know now there's an increased need for people to want to take care of their skin. For example, with women clogging their pores with the excessive use of makeup, I know I have a little makeup mm -hmm. on, but I like it. But yeah. I mean, what do you think about that? Do you think I'm, that's I'm the dangerous of makeup? I'm a huge fan of makeup, clearly. Um, I love makeup. Um, I think that you can do everything responsibly. So using, there are lots of makeup lines that are oil-free. So for my fashionistas and my makeup 
loving patients, I tell them, look for an oil-free um, skincare line. Look for an oil-free makeup line. Um, something else that's been really wildly popular is coconut oil. Coconut oil is the absolute worst for clogging your pores. And while I love it for other things, I love it for, you can put it in your hair, you know, I, I love it for your hair. Um, and I'm not, again, not opposed to it, but there is a, we kind of grade oils from most comedogenic, meaning most likely to clog your pores to least likely, and coconut oil is way on that, um, high on the uh, pore clogging scale. Um, so that's a, another big issue, and all about educating yourself, you right. know? I, mean, I grew up using coconut uh, yeah. oil. That's what we had used yeah. in the household. We used coconut oil grease Same and here. Helen's, I think it was St. Helen's and Dax and everything, mm -hmm. but we, you know, at, after a while you start to realize that it actually does dry your hair out because you're not getting the proper moisture, even though yes, there's an the oil, but at the same time when you clog your pores, you're not allowing the space between the hair and the follicle to grow, number one. Mm -hmm. And two, you're adding more junk into it, so of course it's gonna be more oily and flaky. And that's a, that's a big problem. And I see that a lot in the emergency department when mm -hmm. parents bring their children and say, I don't understand what's going on with their scalp. And I say, well, I'm not a dermatologist, mm -hmm. yeah. but this is what I know growing up, and this is who you can see. Mm -hmm. So a part of primary care is actually seeing your, your dermatologist. dermatologist yeah. Seriously. And, and just to piggyback on what you said, when I say hair, I mean hair, not scalp. Right. Because you're absolutely right. Um, it will hold on to debris, and that will lead to inflammation. That could lead to hair loss. That's a big issue as well. Right. Um, so and we have a major it, problem with hair loss in, in, in the uh, especially in the black community. It's it is a major an problem. epidemic. Very yeah. bad. It's really bad. So what are some of the worst case scenarios, um, Randy, that you've seen in your office of patients um, that had come in for skin treatment due to experimentation with different regimens? such as chemical pills, diff, uh, different facial products, and the same will go for you. I'm going to just kind of go back uh, to what was previously discussed, the basics. I think, especially in the black community, you know, we love Dove soap and cocoa butter. <laughs> and I, got some I do too. They go a long way, but, you know, I always tell a lot of my clients, your skin changes every seven years. So with that, um, you have to keep in mind your environment, what your lifestyle is, you know, because what you said earlier, um, your skin is your largest organ in your body, so like, what are you eating? What are you drinking? Do you smoke? All these things are factors in you know, how your skin is gonna look. So you have to keep those things in mind. And what's important to me is not making you know, her skin try to look like mine, is trying to find her best skin within her. And so uh, I just start basically, basically with trying to get my clients on just a consistent regimen. That's what's gonna make your skin look better is consistency. You know, so, um, which, you know, that's washing, exfoliating, hydrating. If you're not doing any of those, then you need to start doing it now. Like, th those are like the basics. What kind of products do you use? Or what do you promote? Well. <laughs> because it, the problem is, is e economics. And we have to remember that not everybody has the, the uh, privilege to be able to buy certain products. And, and we I have agree. to be realistic that when we see people, we have to take in consideration of what they, how much they make and where they live the resources that they have, right? So if you have a patient or a client that comes in and they said, listen, Randy, I don't have the money to get this type of product. What else can I use for my skin? We have to be realistic. And I'm always about the people. I'm always for the people to see what can we use that's in front of us that are our resources. Well, I'm, I'm very realistic in the sense of, and I'll be very upfront with my, with my clients to let them know that you can buy the $200 cream and you can buy the $20 cream. What it comes down to is ingredients because a lot of these products, what people don't realize is they're all manufactured and produced at the same warehouse. They're just different labels thrown on each thing. So it really comes, comes down to, in a lot of cases, to marketing, you know? Right. So I'll tell my client, hey, you can go to Walmart or you can go to Target and you can find a really good cleanser that's mild and won't over dry your skin. But again, this is customized. This is based on your particular skin types and or conditions. Right. And Kimo, do you think that if a woman chooses to go natural and not wear makeup, it's a cry for attention? I remember there was an article or something about Alicia Keys where she decided to go natural and people made a big deal about it and said, oh, she's crying for attention. And I'm like, wait, but you, we get criticized for wearing makeup, but then when we stop wearing makeup, we still get criticized. What do you think about that? I don't think it was a call for attention. I think she saw a lot of things going on in her skin when she looked in the mirror and she, you know, she believed that it was because of one, her lifestyle and two, you know, probably her diet and three, the products that she was using. It wasn't happy with it. And that's why she decided to go natural. Right. Um, as Dr. Michelle said, you know, you can use the makeup, the makeup and everything else. However, mm -hmm. you know, going natural or, or being, having the ability to do both 
is the sweet spot. So you want to have good skincare to keep your skin clear, but if you want to wear makeup, you want to have that as well. So, you know, you can run outside to the, the laundromat or something without anything on, and you don't have to constantly beat your face. And I think that's what's most important for women, especially, because we're always worried about that dark spot and, oh my God, who's looking at me? They might snap me, and then it's all over social mm -hmm. media. You know, take care of your skin, wear your SPF, the sunblock. Yes, black does crack. My book will be coming out soon so I will be able to explain to you the reasons for that but you have to wear SPF and skin cancer um, and and uh, and I know you know for years you know people have said you know well we have melanin we're protected from skin cancer that is absolutely not true as a matter of fact the prognosis for black people is even higher. greater and higher yes and we actually die a lot quicker from skin cancer in comparison to most other groups so yes we have melanin but you also need that added protection to your skin especially with sunscreen don't go outside just because you're in the sun and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I have a darker complexion, I'm black, that's it. No, you really need to protect your skin, especially right now with the environmental pollution and everything else that's going on, you have to protect your skin even more. Um, chemo, what differentiates Chemo Bentley Beauty products from other natural beauty lines and what qualifies your beauty products to be a go-to for all skin types? I actually hand make everything in my home, it's a family-based business. I have control over every single ingredient, every single label, everything that comes along with my brand, I am responsible for, and that's what makes me or sets me apart from another brand. I really do appreciate that. I see a change. I see people coming back and telling me, oh my gosh, your, your skincare line, it works well. And it's because I know what I put in it. And a lot of people, after they've gotten to a certain point, what they tend to do is start mass producing. And a little secret with mass producing is that they tend to change the ingredients because they can get it cheaper and then the products change, the quality, the texture. Sometimes when you have that mass production where everything is done in a huge factory really fast, it's just kind of like squirt and you push it out, there's, there's not much love in the line. Um, my products are FDA approved. Um, they are constantly um, regulated. I do have to produce submission forms and, and medical data sheets. Um, products are insured, obviously. So there are a lot of regulations and safety proportions that so goes into So pretty much be brand. careful with the people that are selling these products in the street. Just ask them, are you FDA regulated? I'm serious. And insured. Excellent. And, and insured. insured. Be surprised that a lot of, I mean, it's a beautiful thing that many of us are entrepreneurs and we're doing things, but when it comes down to our skin and our bodies and stuff, I would just be very careful where you buy, purchase your products from, especially the people who are making it at home, and ask these questions. Are you FDA regulated, licensed, insured? How do I know that your products are safe? There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the same way how you guys look at, well, how do I know if the doctor's going to really care about me? It's the same thing that you should be invested in when, when it comes down to these skincare products. Randy, what is your number one beauty tip to anyone? moisturize that's like that's so important um, just because to kind of go off what she said yes black does crack I know we say it and it sounds good but um, I think that especially how the weather is now it's so unpredictable I mean think about it like it was 90 degrees about a week or so ago mm -hmm. now it feels like fall it's very confusing mentally so can you imagine <laughs> what your skin is saying like what's going on out there Moisturizing your skin, knowing what your skin type is, that's very important. It'll go a long way. And chemo? Can I get four? Yeah. Cleanse, treat, <laughs> hydrate, and protect. That's right. Those are my four. Say it one more time and louder. Cleanse, treat, hydrate, and protect. Because she only said one, I'll just add a little plus the one in there. Exfoliation. Exfoliation is so important because here's the thing. If you're cleaning, if you're hydrating, that's great. But if you're not getting that dull, dead skin off your surface layer, your epidermis has five layers of skin. In yep. order for the newness to come to the top and for the cell regeneration to happen, you have to get off that dead skin. So exfoliation is very important. I talk to all of my clients, male and female, and that's probably one of the number one things people don't do. And, I'm and gonna I don't add, know why. And I'm going to add, <laughs> drink water. Yes. Cut down the excessive amount of alcohol. Yes. Stop smoking cigarettes. Cut down the amount of weed that you smoke at home. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being honest. I'm serious. This, these are things that we don't take in consideration. You'd be surprised that if you see pictures from, I'm not accusing anyone here of doing anything, but I'm just saying if you notice how your skin look for maybe a few years ago versus now, the amount of uh, uh, consumption of alcohol and cigarettes or tobacco and 
and everything else that we put into our system, you'd be surprised there's a major change with our skin and the way we look. So that's really important. Even with your hair, that's very, very important. So we're going to open up the audience for questions right now. I'm going to pass the mic. <sighs> now I got to get up. Y'all making me get up. Anybody have questions? I'm going to pass the mic around. Oh, brother over here. So you talked a little bit about um, the amount of, of, of the price for skincare. It costs a lot. I mean, we probably all have used different skincare products. We, we've used it. It didn't work, so we got something else. That didn't work. We got something else. So we're spending a lot of money for stuff that we end up just throwing out or just sitting on our shelf. What can we do at home uh, with products that we might have in our kitchen mm -hmm. to treat our skin? Um, this is for Chemo and then Randy as well. Okay, as far as not buying a product, let's say, in the store and you wanted to use something at home, there are very basic things that you can use in your kitchen to help um, as far as calm down acne. Remember, acne is a condition that cannot be cured, but you can keep it at bay. So you can either use honey. Honey is antibacterial. You can just dab a little bit overnight. Uh, the next morning it's going to look calmer. Um, there's another one, um, baking soda. You know, that also calms acne. If it's a very active um, state, you can use the baking soda for that. Um, sometimes I tend to like using the, uh, the Greek yogurt in a combination with the turmeric powder. That's one of my all-time favorites. I'll do that at least once or twice a week. So these are things that you find in your refrigerator that you can use. Remember, this is not a cure. This is just a temporary solution. And you have to keep that in your head because you would still have to see a professional if the condition worsens. And that's what's most important to remember. I'm glad you mentioned honey because that's what we use for burn victims. We do. We use honey for burn victims as well, to keep that in mind. We have a question in the back. I have a question regarding the charcoal mask, because I've heard and I've seen different things, and I've seen them in the store. I'm a little scared, because I don't, I don't know. What are your thoughts on the charcoal mask? Because I know you talked about exfoliating. It seems like it's the it thing. So how safe is it? Okay, so charcoal is actually really good. It's a detoxifier, purifier. For many, many years, the, uh, the Korean society has used it for many things. Uh, for example, for brightening, for whitening, for just an overall uh, pulling out of pollutants in the skin. So what tends to happen is when you use charcoal in the uh, powder form, if you, well, I have a charcoal mask, to be honest with you, and I, mix that with uh, some shea butters and other essential oils and I use it as my daily exfoliator. So they are actually really, really good. Um, there are so many benefits right now on the market for the charcoal. So the hype is real. It, it does work and it's, it's great. Doesn't it hurt when you peel it all? Cause I no, no, no. It's a peel off mass is made with gelatin and water and charcoal. That's the one that you peel off. Uh, solid base mask is made with different ingredients so it's going to wash off like a soap or a cleanser it washes off softer mm -hmm. so the the glycerin base mask or the the gelatin base mask are a little bit different a little bit harsher on the skin so you want to kind of like stay away from that only because depending on the position your skin is what tends to happen is you can also take off too many layers I've had people that has removed that mask and it almost came off like a waxing procedure where their skin and hair and everything else comes off so don't believe that hype all I wanted to add was is that uh, just keep in mind because there are are so many different products and brands out that understand that all of these products are not created equally. So you really have to read and to, to see what it says. And I always, what's really important is make sure you read the directions. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it sounds very simple, but it's, it's, it's the most easiest thing, but the hardest thing for people to do. Because what happens is, oh, I've used that product 10 years ago from another company, but it may have something different in it. It may have a different effect on your skin. So Read the, read the uh, directions are, is important. Also, again, going back to ingredients. Ingredients, ingredients, ingredients. One more question. We have room for one more question. My question is really about how do we break down the barriers to get women of color to use an SPF? Oh, that's easy. Talk to them. <laughs> just talk to us. We're human beings and just let them know the dangers of ultraviolet rays hitting our skin and damaging our skin. Yeah, it's just interesting because I found through my research and I've worked for L'Oreal and Cody yeah. and Unilever that women of color, we're just, we just have a 
um, a stigma against using an SPF. To I think it's probably a little easier for me because I'll take out my phone and show pictures of what it looked like when you have skin cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, I, think I don't want to scare anybody. <laughs> I have but to. I, yeah, yes. I have Absolutely. to. And not that I have daily. to scare you, but I have yes. to be honest with you. I said, this is what it looks like. 10 years don't. or five years or three years from now. And so I, it's easy for me to do that, but that's a conversation, again, going back to seeing your primary care yes. doctor, having that conversation, reading ingredients. If you're not too sure, talk to your doctor, talk to your dermatologist. And we need to use SPF all year round. I know someone said mm -hmm. in the sun, but all year round, yep. even on days where it's cloudy. Thank you. And also the sun ages the skin. We, we are 40 years old. No. Seriously, Wait. we are 4-0, and we've been using SPF since our teens, since somewhere there. I don't remember. Yeah. I, I just don't remember. But, you know, that's something else that is a good sticking point for people that likes to, to sunbathe and be a sun goddess and whatever else you want to call it. We're not saying that you can't go out in the sun, or if you see the sun, you run mm -hmm. and hide. I don't do that, but it's just... Applying sunscreen, reapplication. It's just not putting it on one time and then mm -hmm. that's it for the day because you will get burnt. SPF is sun protection factor. Mm -hmm. So these are things that you have to educate yourself on. And photo aging, I just want to add, photo mm -hmm. aging is, is the real deal. And if you're not familiar with what that is, this example would be you're not wearing sunscreen for 10 years and then yep. over the next five years you'll start noticing you get, you get freckles. You're like, where are these freckles coming from? That's the sun. Oh, I love my freckles. <laughs> That's, freckles yeah, the, since I was these kid. are not natural. <laughs> these are not natural freckles. These are these are caused yeah. from the sun. And so it, what happens is is that because you didn't wear sunscreen for ten years, now you're yeah. actually aging in the next five to ten years because you haven't done so. So it's 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 definitely important. I just want to say thank you all. We're gonna take a little break now. We'll be back in just a bit um, with our panel of body. All right, our body experts are here. And that should be interesting because a lot of people got a lot to say about bodies. Each other's bodies, your mama's body, your daddy's body, somebody's body. We got a lot to say. So take a break, get some drinks. I got my sangria right here. And um, we'll be back, okay? 